we are starting a new cycle, the Joseph story. As you can remember, we've seen Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and now we are reaching Joseph. To me, this is the most beautiful section in the book of uh, Genesis. The story is fascinating. And this story does not only fascinate me, this has fascinated people that wrote literature. If you heard about Thomas Mann, or Mann, that's a German writer, he wrote Joseph and his brothers. And uh, all over the place in uh, the history of universal literature, you will find authors, poets, and uh, prose writers that at least take elements of the Joseph story, because the Joseph story is extremely fascinating and compelling. So let's pray and go to it. Lord, we thank you so much for this new segment of uh, the book of Genesis and this Christ-like hero, Joseph, the way you interacted with his life and uh, we pray, Lord, that we will gain understanding and strength when we will find ourselves in similar situations. May your spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph, a Jesus-like or Christ-like hero. And I would like just to go through a few elements of his life, just to remind you how this character here, Joseph, projects toward somebody else with a J, Jesus Christ, right? Well, first of all, Joseph is special. Uh, Jesus Christ was special. The way he was born was special. Joseph's birth was somewhat special because, you know, his mom, Rachel, couldn't conceive for quite some time. And then uh, all of a sudden, God intervened and opened the womb. Yes, the human component is there, but there is a divine intervention right there so that conception is even made possible. Then you go on and see Joseph being the favorite of his father. In Jesus' case, you have the only begotten of his father. Well, it's not one-to-one -one similarity, but there is something pointing in that direction. Then Joseph has that beautiful, colorful coat that his brothers strip off. And Jesus was stripped naked almost when he was crucified, right? Then we also see Joseph being thrown in a pit while well, they want to kill him. They uh, decide eventually to throw him in a pit. You have stories in Jesus' life when they push him and they want to push him into a gap. They cannot, of course, because that's Jesus. But again, a little hint. Then you go with Joseph and uh, eventually he's sold. Jesus was sold. By whom? By his brothers. Well, in Jesus' case, Judas. But in Joseph's case, who was with the idea of selling Joseph into slavery? Judah? Oh, again, a hint. And eventually, he is in slavery, and uh, Joseph 
is put in prison. Is Jesus put in prison? And then he escapes? Well, for sure. Jesus was put in the prison of death for a while, and he escaped even from that prison. So, of course, when you have typology, because that's the name, you have something small here that foreshadows something much bigger, much larger in the future. And in uh, Joseph's case, he is the type, and then the anti-type is when the shadow meets reality. And uh, probably the most beautiful part of this uh, typology kind of construction is when Joseph, the one that is sold, the one that is put in prison, the one that suffers so much because of his brothers, becomes the savior of whom? Of those same brothers. Similarly, at a much larger scale, Jesus Christ, who suffers at our hands, becomes the savior of those that make him suffer. Beautiful typology. But then let's look at the story. The story is written, as I said, very, very compellingly. And you have two versions of a chiasm on your worksheet. The major difference you see between these two constructions, the two arrangements, is the focal point. Why is there a difference in the focal point? Because there are two major opinions among scholars as to what really is the focal point of the Joseph story. Nobody really debates whether we have a chiasm or not here. I mean, every Bible scholar that understands Hebrew thinking and the way the narrative works recognizes the whole Joseph cycle, the Joseph story, is written out as a chiasm. But there is a point of uh, divergence when it comes to the focal point of the chiasm. And some would suggest that the focal point is chapter 45, verses 1 to 4, that beautiful moment when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Because that moment seems to function as a reversal point. Up to that moment, the story goes in a certain way, and tension is built. But when Joseph comes out and says, hey, I'm your brother, everything turns around, and from that point on, the tension goes away, and the story comes to a beautiful resolution. And yes, I believe that is true, and I believe uh, that focal point should be taken into consideration. Now, there's another way of looking at the story, and uh, there is this section in 46, 8 to 27, we are given a genealogy of Israel. The context is this. So this is happening after the brothers meet, after Joseph reveals himself. And now they go down to Egypt. And uh, when the description of the migration is given... In that description, there is a detailed genealogy of Israel, or descendants of Jacob. And some believe, I myself, I'm inclined somewhat toward that, that this genealogy here should be looked upon as being the focal point of the chiasm. And there's a reason for that. Because 
the way the story is told, it gives you the strong conviction that Joseph is the providential guy used by God, known by God, prepared by God, and used by God ahead of time, so that when Israel is in danger, Joseph becomes the Savior. And that's why the genealogy of Israel is given. Israel being now all the family of Jacob, because now Jacob's name is Israel. So those are the two views when it comes to this focal point. In my understanding, I don't think we have to separate those two views. I believe they can belong together because this whole section can be seen as the focal point and then the tension is solved. Meaning, from the moment when Joseph reveals himself, to his brothers, up to the moment when they settled down in Egypt, that whole section can be seen as the focal point, as the main point of the Joseph story. Obviously, because of the typology that Joseph foreshadows, the story conveys a message of salvation. And the message of salvation is concentrated in this area here, in that central piece of the story. Okay, now for us to see that indeed we have these parallels here, I will point out some specifics. You can look on uh, your worksheet and you can see that the story starts with Joseph and his brothers. His brothers are hostile to Joseph. And Joseph sees those dreams in which his brothers bow in front of him. You know those two dreams. One is with the sheaves and one is with the stars, moon, and sun. Which is a little more complicated because even Jacob says, what? That's what you've seen? I mean, your mom, myself, and everybody will bow in front of you? Hmm. Really, Joseph. But he loves Joseph. So we have that moment here when in a dream, these brothers bow in front of him. Here we have Joseph and his brothers. Joseph is not hostile to them, although he could be for all he suffered at their hands. But what is interesting here that the brothers here really in reality bow in front of him. So the way it starts and the way it ends clearly has something in common. Then you move to point B on one side and the other, and you will see that in chapter 37, there is a moment of death of Joseph. You remember that moment? When his brothers, after they throw him in a pit and then sell him to Egypt, come up with a plan to fool their father, Jacob. They cut the neck of a goat and dip Joseph's clothes in the blood, send it home. And when Jacob sees it, they even have an explanation for that. What happened? Joseph was killed by some savage animals. So, in Jacob's mind, at this point, what happens? Death. Joseph is gone. So, he's separated from his son. Interestingly, on the other end, death really happens, but it does not happen to Joseph. It happens to 
Jacob. Jacob dies, and now Joseph and Jacob are separated. And just the way Jacob mourned Joseph when he thought Joseph was dead, now Joseph mourns his father. Point C. This is a very interesting uh, parallel. C here and C here. We have the story of Judah and Tamar on that side. And, and that's a very weird intercalation or insertion in the Joseph story. So this is what is happening. You have the action speaking about Joseph. And at one point, Joseph reaches Egypt, and the Joseph story stops. And you would think, okay, so now let's see the next episode in the story of Joseph. And what's the next episode? A story about somebody else. And in that story, Joseph is not even mentioned. You have the story of Judah and Tamar, Judah being a brother of Joseph, and a son of Jacob, right? But then, obviously, uh, people would ask the question, okay, so what is the role of this story here? Why such an intercalation in the Joseph story? Because this doesn't have to do with Joseph. This is Judah and Tamar. Joseph is in Egypt, and in the meanwhile, something is happening in the land of Canaan with his brother Judah. What is interesting, however, is that on the other side of the chiasm, you have that description when, I think it's chapter 49, when Jacob blesses his sons. You remember the story? Jacob takes them one by one in the right order, in the order of their birth, who was the firstborn. Reuben, and then Simeon, and then Levi, and then Judah. Now, question, which one of these brothers became the firstborn? Because yes, biologically it was Reuben. Was Reuben blessed as being the firstborn. Uh-uh. Okay, Reuben is not blessed. Why? Because he slept with Bilha. Bilha being one of the concubine wife of his father. And the way the story speaks about it, it seems that at the point when Reuben did that, when he got into the bed of his father, he did that because he wanted to prove in front of his brothers, hey, I'm the firstborn. I can even afford this. But Jacob keeps that in mind. And when the blessings come, not too much blessing on Reuben. Mm -mm. So you would say, okay, then maybe, maybe the next, the second will be the one. And the second one is who? Simeon. Is he blessed? No, actually the story of uh, the blessings takes Simeon or Simeon and Levi together. They are mentioned together. Why? There was something in the past that they did together. That violent episode when they went in and killed all the Shechemites. And they are disqualified. With all this, later on, Levi will become very important. But both of them will be scattered among their nation. And now Judah comes. Do we have a good impression about Judah by that time? Uh, yes and no. Well, maybe no first and then yes at one point. Right? Right? Why no? Because on this side of the story, we have the story of Judah and Tamar. When Judah went out to his 
flocks, and on the way there, he saw somebody dressed like a harlot, and he went in to her. It turned out it was his own daughter-in-law that he mistreated. We'll come to that story somewhat later. And then, when he hears that Tamar did what she did, he didn't realize yet it was him, it was by him that she became pregnant, he starts becoming judgmental on her. What's wrong with you, Judah? And then when it's all revealed, he says, well, she's more righteous than I. So he wakes up, Judah. And we see him once more later on when he plays a very, very interesting role that you would not expect. Because remember, Judah was first the guy that suggested Joseph should be sold in slavery. That's not good, right? Then to hit rock bottom, you have that immorality issue of Judah and hypocrisy when he has high expectations of his uh, daughter-in-law, but not of his own behavior. But yes, he shows up again. When does he show up? It's that critical moment with Benjamin. So this is the second trip. There was a trip first. Okay, There was a trip when uh, they all could go back with the exception of Simeon, the guy that wanted to kill him. When he went to his brothers, Simeon said, hey, let's kill him. Reuben intervened and said, let's throw him in a pit. And then Judah kicked in and said, let's sell him. I mean, very interesting collaboration among brothers. Okay, but then something changes. For the second trip, Joseph told them, you have to bring Benjamin. Otherwise, Simeon will stay in prison and you would be confirmed as spies. So, Reuben speaks to his father, allow Benjamin to come with us. Reuben, once again, wants to be the firstborn. He takes responsibility for Benjamin. Interestingly, it seems that Jacob doesn't really believe him, doesn't trust him. But because of the famine that is becoming worse and worse, he has to release Benjamin to go with them. So now Benjamin is with them. This is the second trip. And they are heading back home already. Simeon is out, Benjamin is in the crew, they are heading home, and somebody comes shouting, stop, stop, stop. What? The cup of my master. The cup that he reads the future from. And they stop, and they are sure they didn't take anything that was not theirs, and they find a cup where? In Benjamin's bag. Back to the palace again. And that's when Judah intervenes, right? And he says, no, no, no. You can't do this. You can't take Benjamin, because that's what the leader, the right hand of Pharaoh says, okay, you're free. You're good to go, with the exception of the guy that we found the cup with. And Judah says, no, no, no. You can't do this. Our father will die. He, he, no, no. I will stay. Ah, Judah changed. He's not the same guy now. He even takes up a Christ-like attitude. He 
mediates or intermediates, and he's ready to stay instead of Benjamin. So Judah is changed. And, of course, God's divine ways are in the story. Jacob here, when he gives the blessings, so that's the, that's the role of this story here. That's why we have that insertion of the Judah and Tamar story. To be placed in contrast to what happens on the other side. When Judah, yes, this Judah, this immoral guy, this hypocrite, he will become, by God's grace, the firstborn that carries on the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jacob seems to favor Joseph. If it had been only him, I think, I may be wrong, but I think Jacob would have given the firstborn right to Joseph. And in a way, it almost seems like he did that. But in the blessings, he blesses Judah and makes him the first. And the prophecy about the Messiah that is in the Judah blessing is just fascinating. We will see that when we get there. Okay, so do we now understand why the story of Judah is in there? To create this contrast in the story. And then you have a point D. In point D, you have uh, those unexpected reversals. On one side, here, you have the birth of uh, Judah's two sons, Zerah should be the first and then Paris, but they switch inside the womb and Paris comes out and then Zerah. Potiphar's wife is guilty. Joseph is innocent, but it's reversed. Potiphar's wife comes out innocent and Joseph comes out guilty and gets into prison. There are some words, very interestingly, placed there that parallel one side the other. And uh, one of them, and I think this is very interesting, is the word bread, lehem. The word bread in 48 verse 7. I want to read this to you. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way where there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Lehem is the word for bread. And this is, this is on this side. On this other side is not Bethlehem, it's just Lehem, it's just bread, but I would like to show you how interestingly it is done. Verse 6. Then he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. So Potiphar did not care about anything but the bread which he ate. That usage of bread there, lehem, according to some commentators, and I agree to that, is practically a way, a beautiful way of saying everything has been placed under my hand except his wife. The bread that he ate is a Hebraism for his wife. Because that's what Joseph will tell her, Potiphar's wife, hey, everything is under my hand, but not you. You are his bread. But you have lehem here, and you have lehem, Beth, lehem over here. On this other side, we also have... Uh, 
Jacob blessing Joseph's two sons. Manasseh is the elder. Ephraim is the younger. And that's how Joseph places them in front of Jacob. And when Jacob uh, reaches out to them, he does this. And that's another reversal. So in point D, we have those reversals. And uh, yeah, here, E and E over here. This is all about Joseph being wise and becoming the hero that saves Egypt and not only from famine. And then you have uh, the focal point, which is, I believe, this, the moment when he reveals himself to his brothers and the genealogy of Israel combined. Because he, the one that is the savior of the brothers, reveals himself and saves this Israel. We can uh, see later on in the story of uh, Jesus how he comes out and saves his brothers. Questions? This is what Joseph says, chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. That's what it means, divine providence. When God takes something and reverses it, turns it around in the most critical moment, Sometimes when you think everything is lost, God has that ability. That does not change the action of the brothers, however. There was a situation in which somebody did something to me personally, something really bad. And out of that bad thing that that person did, something great came out. And later on, I met with that person, and he said, See, if I had not done that to you, uh, that's not the story. The fact that God takes something and turns it around doesn't change the value of the action of the person that did the wrong. There is forgiveness for that, yes, but it doesn't change the value of it. It's not like now that Joseph is second in command after Pharaoh, now it means that what they did, what their brother, his brothers did, it was an excellent thing. It was like they were visionaries and they said, hmm, do we want Joseph to become second in command after Pharaoh? Let's sell him. That's not how his history works, right? So the question is, why didn't, with, with all the beauty of Joseph, right? I believe Judah got converted. And that's why he became the firstborn. But I believe from far, the character of Joseph outshines the character of Judah. At least based only on the description of the book of Genesis. So then the question is, why didn't Jacob bless then Joseph to be the one that carries on the covenantal blessing of the genealogy of Jesus Christ? I don't know. Maybe it's because God knew in advance his story and knew what kind of descendants Joseph would have, and his descendants did not square with God's expectations. That can be. I have no evidence for that. But the reasoning is correct because God knows the end from the beginning. So he has the ability to sort out whether he wants to go this way 
or this way. Nevertheless, one thing is hanging as a question here. You have, out of the 12 brothers, you have one that shines. At least he shines in your eyes, because from the very get-go, you are favoring him. Maybe that's exactly why. He was too much of a favorite of his father to be put in that situation. Judah was problematic in many ways, up to a certain point at least, but then the change is obvious. You may also infer that you go chronologically. You go from the eldest to the youngest. And then God coming down from Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Okay, this one is going to be good. I think it's very human <laughs> to reason like that. Uh, but humanly speaking, Jacob could have used this reasoning. My favorite wife, well, my favorite, my beloved wife, the wife that I really wanted to marry, because he never wanted to marry Leah. Leah was pushed on him. That's the fact of the story. So since Rachel is my beloved wife, and Joseph is the firstborn of Rachel, my beloved wife, then he should be the firstborn. He should take on uh, the genealogy, and let's go with this. God's plans are unlike our human plans, it seems. Yeah, good question. So, how did Jacob even know whom to bless in what way? Right? Because at one point in chapter 49, this is what he says, and Jacob called his sons, that's verse 1, and said, gather together that I may tell you Tell what? What shall befall you in the last days? That's how this translation says it. Does anybody have a different translation? Because that's not very precise. Please. Yeah, somewhat, somewhat better. In the days to come. But it seems that a better translation is so that I can tell you what will happen to you in the far future. So this is not just immediate future, what, it was going, what was going to happen to them right then or right after. It's a distant future. So this is prophetic insight. So the question comes back again, how did Jacob know this? Well, Jacob new things from God. Throughout his story, we have moments when God comes and speaks to Jacob. And uh, it's quite possible that Jacob took those pieces of information from God himself. Very, very insightful questions regarding the birthright, the, the firstborn right. So the question is, was that used in the Bible as, as, as an incentive for the next generation or next generations to stay closer to God and to have that spirituality that would recommend them to carry on the firstborn right? I cannot say based on anything that I can point out that the answer is yes to that. We can, however, human re reason like that. You may think, okay, since from the time of Abraham, you have Ishmael, but he's not the firstborn that carries on. Although biologically he is, no, Isaac steps in. And then in the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, Esau would be the biological firstborn, and yet Jacob's 
heart is that one by divine provision, and that is foresignaled by God. So in Jacob's case, God lets Rebecca know even before the two guys are born. And they were playing soccer in uh, their mom's belly. God told Rebecca, hey, this guy will be above this guy. And then you have this story of um, Jacob and his sons, where the firstborn right skips one, two, three, and only he's the fourth. Humanly speaking, you may think, okay, so if you are in a family of four, or, yeah, say a family of four sons, then you can think, okay, if my eldest brother would not uh, be the right guy, then maybe it's going to be me. I will step up to that responsibility. I don't have any passage for that. More than that, the first born right later on was taken on by the Levites. So there's a moment in the book of Exodus when uh, there is a huge fallout between Israel and God, between God's people and God, and the Levites are those that stand for God, and God places the Levites instead of the firstborn of all the families of Israel. So from that point on, it seems to me that they take on the responsibility of the firstborn because one of the responsibilities of the firstborn was to be the priest of the family. And the Levites, and the, from the Levites, one branch will become the priesthood of the people. Nevertheless, at the level of every family, there still is a focus on the firstborn. If you take, for instance, the story of David, who is going to be the king after David? It got so wrong that they started killing one another, those children, David's children, because every but he wanted to be the firstborn. While David had promised to Bathsheba that her child will be the king, not the first one that she conceived when they were in the sin context, when David took the wife of one of the commanders of the army, but the one that was born after that, Solomon, he would, or Shlomo, he would become the king. So again, the firstborn. In what way that would be an incentive? I have a hard time answering that. But obviously, if somebody knew was the firstborn, and to these days, we have still that mentality, and I think rightly so, the firstborn of a family has to be prepared. What if the father passes away, who's going to take on responsibilities? Spiritual and material. That's why you have that double portion given to the firstborn, because in case the father is taken out of the equation, the firstborn has to provide for the rest of the family. Yeah, thank you so much for that observation. Let me repeat it for, for the camera. So the observation is that uh, in, in these interactions of God with human beings, in these stories, you can also see a macro level fight or battle between good and evil, where God's character is under dispute. And uh, I think that is a correct observation. God is able to turn bad things into good things. That is confirmed in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 as well. All things work for good for those that love God. Most people stop here. But there's one more 
aspect there and are called, somebody tell me, according to his purpose or according to his plans, which is very important. And that kind of dynamic is indeed played out in the story of the patriarchs. God has purposes in his story. God has plans. It may seem at one point that somebody would square from a human standpoint with God's plans. Like the firstborn. You would expect that the firstborn would square with God's plans. And then you notice that God has a different option. And he goes for that option. Why? I rarely use this argument. I think it's often misused, and that's why I try not to use it too often. But I think the argument for that is that God is God, and he has the right to choose whom to use in what way. For instance, just as an illustration, in my family, we are four brothers. Each is very different. I mean, each. Out of the four, I'm the second. I became a pastor, not the firstborn. Why? I don't know. God has his ways. It could have been the firstborn. It could have been the second born, the third born, the fourth born, or none of them, or all four of them. But it, there are two elements here. One is God's plans, and then how we play into God's plans. Because even if I'm convinced, and I have been convinced ever since I got this understanding that God's plan for me was ministry, I was convinced I have to go this way, but I've always been tempted to go another way. You see what I'm saying? So you can see these realities, these options, choice in the life of those heroes of the Old Testament. Joseph could have been a different person. Had he given just a little bit in to Potiphar's wife, just a little bit. I, I want to show you something that I think is very interesting. In uh, Genesis 39, verse 10. And, and you, you tell me what is interesting about it. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. But this is not like, okay, once in a while, somebody tries to hook you in. Uh -uh. No, this is day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Is there a difference between the two? Maybe just be with her, just a little bit. See what I'm saying? What it means integrity. What manifestation of uprightness. Because she obviously wants him to lie with her. And the text tells me he did not heed her in spite of the fact that day by day, day by day, hey, after a while, the human psyche, and this is a young man. This is a young man in his late teens or early 20s. Okay? Hormonal, if you want. And day by day, day by day, day by day, and he did not lie with her or be with her. We didn't do it. We just spoke. We just sat one next to the other. See what choice means in the life of a human being. That's a very good question. Where is dinner? 
in the blessing chapter 49. We don't know where she is. Did she get married at one point? You know she's been through a rape kind of experience. What happened? If there was some sort of blessing, possibly it happened some other time. If you look back at uh, the Rebecca story, you remember the Rebecca story? Not Rachel, the one before, Rebecca. Rebecca being the wife of Isaac. When she left home, when Eliezer was going to take her to marry Isaac, you remember that moment. You remember how she left? She left with the blessing of the family. Go back and read. A beautiful blessing. A blessing that almost sounds like the Abrahamic blessing, that she will be blessed and she will be fruitful and she will... Beautiful blessing. But that happens when the girl is given into marriage to a guy. I could imagine, although I don't have very strong evidence for that, that in Dina's case, we should be looking for something like that. But the text doesn't include that story. See, see what the dilemma is? But I don't think the text either excludes it. It makes it possible. Maybe when Dina got married to a guy, whoever that guy may have been, at the time when she was given into marriage, that's when the family blessing given by the father, or in the father's absence, the firstborn male of the father, possibly, they could have given Dina a certain kind of blessing. But again, this is more like speculation. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for all the beautiful te teachings that we can get from it. We pray that you will continue to bless us and uh, shape our lives. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.